This is the Pearson Edexcel October 2021 Chemistry Unit 6 paper. Uh, this paper is 50 marks. I will go straight to the first question. Question 1 says, this question is about copper and some of its compounds. So we have to make sure we know that this is talking about copper and the compounds out of copper. So they say, two tests were carried out on separate samples of an aqueous solution of copper 2 sulfate. Copper to sulfate. They said test one, a few drops of aqueous sodium hydroxide were added to a sample of the copper to sulfate solution. When you add aqueous sodium hydroxide, it means this is a deprotonation reaction. And uh, for a deprotonation reaction to occur, let's see, they say, state what you would see. Observation. Because it's copper, convert it into, of course, when you react a, a solution of copper with copper hydroxide, we would assume that a pale blue solution uh, is going to be turned into a blue precipitate. So that is the observation you see. So for the next part, we see test two. They say a few drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid were added to another sample uh, of copper two sulfate solution. More of the concentrated hydrochloric acid was added until it was present in excess. When we add excess uh, HCl in concentrated form, it means this is ligand substitution because you guys know uh, the chloride, uh, chloride ligands are going to be surrounding the copper. But since we used excess, it means all the copper is going to be substituted or all, all the water ligands are basically going to be substituted by copper. However, the key thing is we cannot fit by, by chloride, sorry, but we cannot fit uh, more than four chloride ions around the copper, so we, the resulting product is going to be copper, of course, tetrachlorocuprate, uh, this one here, tetrachlorocuprate, which uh, is going to be kind of yellow in color. The next part they say describe the changes that will be observed. Now, we know the, co the compound of copper is basically going to be blue, however, the product is going to be yellow. Now, we know that as blue, we will have some reactant left behind, which is blue, and some product which is being formed. It means a mixture of blue and yellow will produce a green color. So we're going to see a color transition. The solution will change from blue to green and then to yellow. The green color is due to a mixture of uh, the, tetra, the tetrachlorocuprate, which is yellow, as well as the hexa aqua copper 2, which is blue. So we continue to the next part. We say describe a test and its positive result to confirm the presence of sulfate. Sulfate ion in another sample of copper to sulfate solution. To test for presence of sulfate ion, you can use add, of course, it's going to be HCl, add HCl, followed by aqueous barium chloride, and the white precipitate is going to be formed. In another time, you can say add nitric acid. It's going to be nitric acid, of course, aqueous, uh, followed by barium nitrate of course, like that. And then we will see, we're gonna get, of course, a white precipitate as well, white PPT of, of course, a, a barium sulfate. Uh, we go to the next part. It says an electrochemical cell was made from the electrode system presented by these half equations. So we have these two half equations. Of course, you see, this is more positive than that. So this is gonna be to the left. The more positive one is gonna be to the right. So it means we can combine these two to find the overall equation for this reaction, which is going to be, of course, since this goes to the other side, it means copper is going to be donating electrons, donate electrons, and this is going to be using them up. So it means this is going to be to the right and the other to the left. So we will say E right minus E left, and therefore E right 0 0.77 minus E left 0 0.34, and the overall is going to be 0 0.43 volts. Do not forget to put the units. Next part says, a student drew a diagram of an experiment to measure the standard EMF of the cell. So this is what we have. And they say, identify three mistakes in this diagram and the changes needed to correct them. Assume the standard conditions were, uh, were used. Let us see, how can they use the platinum wire in the salt bridge? No, that is out. That is one mistake. Uh, the other one here we have, let me see, this is a K. Here, the, there is a mixture of ion 2 and ion 3. You cannot use an ion electrode. That is wrong. And then here we have, they use the low supply, the low voltage supply. They have to use a high resistance voltmeter. So these are the three mistakes. Here, down here, I wrote in the table, using a platinum wire to connect the half cells. 
is wrong, so you replace it with a salt bridge. This salt bridge could contain potassium nitrate as well as all potassium chloride. It could be sodium nitrate, sodium chloride, or ammonium nitrate, ammonium chloride. Then here, the iron half cell, you have to replace it with platinum because, of course, there are two solutions made from the same, two uh, ions in solution made from the same metal, so you cannot use the metal again as the electrode. So you have to use platinum. Next part is a low resistance voltmeter. We have to replace with, with a high resistance voltmeter. So that is okay. We go to the next part, which says brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. A student determined the percentage of copper in a sample of brass. Let's see the procedure. Weigh the sample of brass, place the brass in a beaker, and add concentrated nitric acid until uh, all the brass dissolves. Transfer the solution and washings to a 250 volumetric flask. Of course, this is a, making a standard solution. And make the solution up to the mark with distilled water and mix. Pipe ahead, 25 centimeters cubed into a conical flask, and then neutralize the excess nitric acid in the solution. Of course, then next, add 10 centimeters cubed of potassium iodide to the solution, which is going to be excess to the conical flask. Titrate the iodine produce, uh, which is uh, with 0.1 mole but it's meter cubed sodium thiosulfate solution using stash indicator, of course. Repeat the titration until concordant result or concordant titers are obtained. The first question says copper and zinc both react with concentrated nitric acid to form the metal nitrates, a metal, di uh, base metal nitrate, nitrogen dioxide, and water. They say write the balanced equation for the reaction between zinc and concentrated nitric acid. Because they gave us this information here, it's easy for us to write. We know the products are going to be metal nitrates, nitrogen dioxide, and water. So you just write zinc plus nitric acid. The other side, we get zinc. Zinc nitrate, of course, is going to be like that. And we know NO2 and we know water. Then we begin to balance off. Balancing off, we see this nitrate here is 2, so we can try to put a 2 here, to put a 2. We can position a 2 here. Uh, of course, um, this is not the final part yet. When we position a 2 there, there is a problem the other side because now the nitrogens are not going to be enough, so it means we have to increase the number to account for this nitrogen. So you could use a number more than that because if I put a 2 here, it means I only have two nitrates here, two nitrogens here, but how about those nitrogens there? When I put a 4 and I put a 2 here to account for those nitrogens, it means there are 4 here. This is, uh, of course, this is okay. There are 2 here, but I've accounted for the other 2. And uh, the remaining part is to account for the hydrogens. Here, I have 2 hydrogens, or 4 hydrogens, so I have to put a 2 here to make them 4. And lastly, I think everything should be balanced by now. Yep, it's okay. Next part says, name the, name the most suitable piece of apparatus to measure the 10 centimeters cube of uh, potassium iodide. Of course, it could be a measuring cylinder, which is 10 centimeters cube. Next, set at what point the titration, uh, the, starch the starch solution should be added. The solution should be added uh, when the solution, basically the starch should be added when the solution start turns straw color or what you call pale yellow. That is uh, when it should be added, because if you add it initially, then you're going to form a starch iodine complex, which is going to be insoluble, and it means it's going to use up some of the iodine, binding it with the starch, making it unavailable for the titration, and that means the tidal value is going to be less than predicted, and you'll assume that the number of moles of iodine that were present were less, yet it's because some iodine has been taken away by the starch to form the insoluble complex. Next part says... Only copper two ions in the solution react with the aqueous potassium iodide. Uh, the iodine reacts with sodium thiosulfate, so they give us that. The results are the mass of brass sample is 3.9 grams. The mean titer is that. And then they give us the volume, basically that. And they're asking us to cal calculate the percentage by mass of copper in the sample of brass. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. We will begin with finding the number of moles. Because they've given us the main titer as well as the concentration, I'll begin with the number of moles of theosulfate, which is concentration times volume. The concentration is this. The volume converted to decimeters cubed is that. When you apply that to you get that as the number of moles. We know from the reaction that the ratio is 2 to 1. So it means the number of moles of iodine should be half the number of moles of theosulfate. That gives us the number of moles of iodine. 
However, going back to this, this iodine here is exactly that iodine. So these moles are exactly the moles we saw there, 1.43 times 10 power negative 3. That means the moles of this copper are going to be 2 times the moles of iodine because the ratio is 1 to 2. So this is going to be uh, what we have here. So these are going to be the number of moles of copper 2 in the sample. Now, remember these are number of moles in 25, so we need to find the number of moles into 50, which is going to be that times 10. This gives us the number of moles into 50. Now, to find the mass of copper in brass, we will get the number of moles of copper 2 times the molar mass of copper, which is 63.5, and we get this as the mass. Again, to find the percentage of copper is going to be the mass of copper divided by the mass of the whole thing times 100, which gives us 46.6% as uh, the answer to this part. So this brings us to the end of question one. Let's go to the next part. Question two says two organic compounds, A and B, are colorless liquid. Each compound contains only one functional group. So this is important when we see it contains only one functional group. So we have A as well as B. Two tests were carried out on A, two tests on A. The observation for each test was recorded in the table. Complete the statement in the inference column by writing the names or formally of the functional groups. So the first test says a few drops of A were added to centimeters cubed of 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine. An orange precipitate was formed. Everybody should know that when 2,4-DNPH is added to any substance or any compound and you get an orange precipitate, that is a confirmation that there is an, basically, there is an, either an aldehyde or a ketone. It confirms presence of a carbonyl group. So here we see they say A could contain an aldehyde or a ketone, aldehyde or ketone. The part two says, test two, a few drops of A were added to two centimeters cubed of Fellings solution. Uh, and uh, the mixture was warmed in a water bath. A red precipitate was formed. In this case, when we use felling solution, of course, we know this one contains copper 2 plus, which is going to be blue. Felling solution is going to be blue. If a red precipitate is formed, it means copper 1, ox uh, copper one oxide has been produced. So in this case, we see uh, this is a conversion. Uh, again, again, this is going to be an, a testing that are showing that an aldehyde was converted to a carboxylic acid, which is oxidation. So the functional group present should be an aldehyde. This confirms if you get a positive test with a uh, filling solution, it shows that it's an aldehyde because we have already confirmed that it's a carbonyl. Give the name or formula of the red precipitate. Of course, it's going to be copper, one oxide. Uh, that is, let's go to the next part. So part B says, a simplified mass spectrum of A is shown. Of course, that is what we see here. We see the relative intensity as well as the mass to charge. So they say, uh, give the formula of one of the ions responsible for the peak at 29. If we know that this is an aldehyde and there is a peak at 29, there are two things that could bring a 29. If it's that, that, or if it's that, that. Now, because here, of course, these are the two possibilities. You can see them there. That could give us the mass 29. So these are the potential answers. A contains one functional group. Uh, given, uh, give the mass to charge of the molecular ion of structure A. So we can see this is at 58. It means the molecular ion is going to be 58. That part here is 58. The mass to charge. Mass to charge is 58. And they want us to know the structure of A. To find out the structure of A, we already know it's an aldehyde, so it has this functional group. And we already know its total is going to be 58. So we can put a CH2 here and then fill in with another CH2 because, of course, 29 plus 29 gives us 58. So we know that is going to be the possible answer. Let's go to the next part. They said two tests were carried out on B. So again, two tests on sample B. Complete the statement in the observation and inference column. So the first test three says two drops of B were dissolved in two centimeters cubed of water and a few drops of universal indicator were added. Then they say the color of the mixture was when the solution was alkaline. Using a universal indicator to test any solution, or you want to detect, test the pH. If something is alkaline, it means the universal indicator is going to be blue in color, so that is the answer. And test four says, uh, B was added drop by drop to aqueous, so, uh, aqueous copper to solve it until B was present in excess. A pale blue precipitate formed with a first few drops of B, and this dissolved to form a deep blue solution. This is really easy. A deep blue solution, of course, uh, when excess B was added. 
name the function of group present in uh, of course in here the function of group is going to be an amine of course it cannot be ammonia because we already know it's an organic compound so it's going to be an amine so let's see next part says b b has a molar mass of 59 gram per mole suggests the structure of a uh, structure of b we know it has this functional group and then we just fill up the rest which is going to get and again the question say this has only one functional group i think you can see someone yeah. carried out an experiment uh, to determine the enthalpy change when solid lithium chloride dissolved in water to form a solution so the procedure was step one use a pipette to place 25 centimeters cubed of distilled water into a polystyrene cup measure and record the initial temperature of the water and add 2.12 grams of lithium chloride to the water then four star the mixture and record the highest temperature reached they say A, give a reason why a polystyrene cup was used instead of a glass beaker. Of course, a polystyrene cup is a better insulator than a glass beaker. You guys know glass is not that much of a good insulator. So the next part says the temperature rise was 12.5 degrees Celsius. Calculate the enthalpy here. Calculate the enthalpy change of, form of the, for the formation of, this, of the, this solution of lithium chloride. So they say include a sign and units for your answer. They gave us the specific capacity and they gave us the density. So, of course, we are looking for the mass of water. And you guys know if you're given density and volume, you can multiply density and volume to find the mass. So, this is density times volume gives us 25 grams. And then, since we know the formula for Q is equal to mc delta t, we are given them, we've calculated the mass specific capacity is here and then the temperature change this gives us 1306.25 joules please remember this comes out as joule if you want to convert it to kilojoules you have to basically divide by a thousand to convert it to kilojoules and then next we want to find the number of moles of lithium chloride so we know the mass and the molar mass mass is 2.12 and the molar mass is calculated by adding the two giving us this now, since we know the value of Q and we know the number of moles, we can use the formula this to find the enthalpy change, which is going to be the negative Q in kilojoules per mole, in kilojoules, divide by the number of moles, and the answer we get is going to be in kilojoules per mole with a negative sign. So this is going to be an exothermic reaction. Next part says the thermometer used to measure the temperature change had an uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.25. For each measurement, calculate the percentage uncertainty in the temperature change in the experiment. So here, of course, to, you, you know that you read the thermometer twice. So in this case, we have to say 2 times plus or minus 0 0.25, then divide by the value measured times 100, and here we get a plus or minus 4%, which is the percentage uncertainty. To continue with D, the temperature rise in this experiment was lower than expected due to heat loss to the surrounding. Describe changes to the procedure that would give a more accurate temperature rise. Again, this is more accurate temperature rise. That means we will have to monitor the temperature very carefully, careful monitoring. So you say include in your, of course, in our description, we should include a, st a stopwatch, include using a, a stopwatch and details of a graph you would plot. So, of course, we are going to start by putting the sample. Of course, we put the sample maybe in a specific, like in a polystyrene cup. Actually, let me do like a polystyrene cup. You put in the sample. Then we'll start, we'll start the stopwatch and we'll measure the temperature of the water every 30 seconds. Remember, we're going to put in the water and measure the temperature in order to ensure the temperature of the water is going to be stable. So for 30 seconds, 30 seconds until two and a half minutes. And then to this, we will add the lithium chloride. Usually, we can add the lithium chloride exactly after three minutes. That time is enough for the temperature to be stable. And when we add the lithium chloride, we have to use our thermometer to measure the temperature change because as this lithium chloride dissolves in the water, temperature is going to be, or heat is going to be generated. The generation of heat is going to lead to an increase in temperature, so we can measure the temperature. Change, the temperature. Uh, record the temperature for every 30 seconds for another five minutes, so we will have our results in a table, and then we will plot a graph of temperature against time. Then we will have to join the results. Let's assume if a graph came off like this for the first 
uh, three minutes when we are monitoring and then at exactly three minutes we put in the sample this is when you put in lithium chloride if you put in lithium chloride of course we expect the temperature to increase it's going to increase maybe like that and then later on the temperature is going to decrease as there is no more lithium chloride that is reacting so it means we can draw a line of best fit there and uh, if these results are many and then a line of best fit here where the two values meet we can connect it the other side to know the maximum temperature that could be reached and then we can measure the initial temperature and that maximum reach temperature and get a temperature change for that specific experiment so i'm going to remove this so this brings us to the end of question, question four this question is about the alkaline hydrolysis of an ester X, uh, they say X is an alkyl, alkyl benzoid and can be represented by the formula that uh, where R is an alkyl, uh, alkyl group. So here we see this is the ester, that is a sodium hydroxide. Of course, it's going to be aqueous because this is alkaline hydrolysis. When alkaline hydrolysis is carried out, we create a carboxylic salt and an alcohol. This carboxylic salt can be reacted with H plus or an acid to produce a carboxylic acid. The question says measure of 5 centimeters cubed, the procedure basically, 5 centimeters cubed of X and pour it into a pure shaped flask. Add 25 centimeters cubed of an excess of sodium hydroxide. They are using excess to ensure that, uh, of course, hydrolysis goes to completion and add a few anti-bumping granules. The next part, they say heat the flask and uh, contents under reflux. This is heating under reflux for 20 minutes. Allow the apparatus to cool and then we arrange it for distillation. Distill the mixture and collect two centimeters cubed of the alcohol. Step four, allow the pH of flask to cool. Uh, pour the contents into a beacon and add excess that is hydrochloric acid. This is to form the carboxylic acid in that step here, the part I showed you there. The impure benzoic acid forms as crystals in the mixture. And then step five, recrystallize the benzoic acid using water as the solvent and weigh the dry crystals and determine their melting temperature. Okay, let's see the first part they say. Uh, let me erase this. I used it previously, so we can do this. A student drew a diagram of the apparatus set up for distillation. This is setting up for distillation. Uh, there are three errors in the diagram. Assume the apparatus is clamped correctly and the, uh, the appropriate source of heat is used. So the first part says, are we identifying three errors? The first error is about the thermometer. The bulb of the thermometer should be at this point and the thermometer pointing out. So that is wrong. There is an error here. There is another error in uh, the conical flask being used as a source of heating. That is, uh, there is an error there. And uh, because there is no side arm here, there is an error in putting in basically stoppering this place because it means pressure is going to build up and uh, this could lead to disastrous situations so i said error one the conical flask correction use a pure shaft flask uh, or you could use a boiling flask the error number two the thermometer bulb is in the reaction mixture of course correction use a thermometer uh, the thermometer bulb should be in level with the entrance to the condenser and apparatus three uh, the apparatus is sealed basically at the end towards the collector, so we have to remove the call, the this, the remove the stopper. I would say instead of saying boiling tube from the collector to prevent the buildup of pressure, or we could use a side arm in order to prevent that buildup of the pressure, basically. So I will continue to the next part. Uh, let's go to uh, part B, basically. They say a distillate collected in step three is the alcohol ROH. Describe the chemical test and its positive result to show the presence of an OH group, an alcohol, OH group in any alcohol. Now this is about in any alcohol. So OH group, we can use PCO5 or we can use sodium. So here, if you use PCO5, uh, you're gonna, of course, pen, uh, phosphorus pentachloride, you're gonna get misty fumes that are gonna be observed, misty fumes. And uh, the, reaction for, the reaction that takes place is going to be this, and the misty fumes are going to be due to production HCl. Or when we use sodium, we're going to see bubbling that is going to be observed. Again, the reaction that occurs is going to be here. The bubbling is going to be due to hydrogen gas being produced in this reaction. C1 says, write an equation for the reaction taking place in step 4. Use structure formally for the organic substance and state symbols are not required. So here... Uh, of course, in that step, we see that the, the carboxylic salt is reacting with the acid to produce a carboxylic acid and then sodium chloride. 
like I say, this is the final step when you carry out uh, alkaline hydrolysis. You produce a carboxylic salt, and when you add the acid, the carboxylic salt is converted into a carboxylic acid. So Roman 2 says, state what should be done to separate the benzoic acid from the mixture produced in step 4 by carrying out step 5. Carrying out step 5, of course, here we have to filter under reduced pressure. Here, because they were, you don't have to mention that filter when hard because they were not interested in this part. Filter when hard, you're removing insoluble impurities. So the insoluble impurities, so this is not it. We just have to filter under reduced pressure. And step D says, describe the first stage in the recrystallization in step five. Now, when we are carrying out recrystallization, we begin by dissolving the crystals in minimum amount of hard solvent. Since the solvent used here was water, we have to use minimum volume of minimum volume, basically, of course, of hot water. Dissolve the crystals in minimum amount, minimum volume of hot water, which is okay. Next part says the melting temperature of pure benzoic acid is 122. State two ways in which the melting temperature of benzoic acid is not. Um, state two ways in which the melting temperature changes if benzoic acid is not pure. So this question is very common. Of course, in, not in relationship to benzoic acid, but in relation to anything else. The melting temperature is going to be lower and the sample is going to melt over a range of temperatures if it's not pure. So let's see the next part says the molar mass of X is 178 gram per mole. Deduce the formula of the alkyl group in R. So here we have, uh, of course, if we have 178 gram per mole and uh, we know this is carbon 6, H5, COO, it means yet they told us that that is alkyl. The remaining part is going to be four carbons and nine hydrogens. Now, next part, they say, use your answer in F1 to draw the structures of the four possible alcohols. Here we can see the four possible alcohols could be because, of course, we know uh, if it's carbon-4, hydrogen-9, and then it has OH, we can see four carbons, nine hydrogens, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then the OH. So there is a possibility of the primary alcohol, possibility of the tertiary alcohol, possibility of a secondary alcohol, and a possibility of another form of primary alcohol, which could be produced. So two primary alcohols and then a secondary and a tertiary. So here they say the part of the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of X corresponds to the R, uh, to the R group contains only two peaks. Deduce the structure of X. Now here we're looking at the structure of the whole thing. Remember they have told us contains only two peaks, two peaks of carbon. So it means we should have um, carbon-13 NMR of X contains R groups. Uh, okay, the R groups contain only two peaks. So it means there is one peak in this R group. So, and then uh, the, basically there is this part, which is one peak and that part that is the other peak. Remember, this is the R group. So if it has, it means it's only the tertiary alcohol that could be a suitable pro, a suitable, uh, a suitable compound or suitable substance that would have produced only two carbon-13 NMR peaks. So you can see this is peak one in carbon-13 NMR and this is peak two. So it means when you combine that, you would have formed an ester, which is this. So X would be the ester. Let me try to clean it up for you. This is the ester we're looking for, this one here. And uh, this brings us to the end of question four, as well as the end of this paper. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. I'll see you in our next paper. Thank you.